All right. Well, hey, good morning, church. Woo, wasn't that great worship? Let's give the band and our Lord one more hand for that. That was great. That was great. Hey, and I want to say uh, welcome to all of you joining us online this morning. Well, the young man was about 17 years old, and uh, he was in my youth group at the time, and he came up to me and he says, Pastor Jim, I, I got to talk to you. I need your advice. I said, well, what's going on? He says, I'm dating three girls. I said, well, that's okay. You know, three girls, that's all right. You got to date around a little bit, you know. And uh, he said, no, no, you don't understand. I said, what? He says, I have three girlfriends. <laughs> girlfriends? He goes, yeah. He goes, I mean, like, like I'm in three committed relationships. I said, what are you thinking? He said, well, I know, I know. And I said, well, tell me about, don't they know about each other? He says, no, no. He said, one is out of high school. One is here in the youth group, and she goes to a different school. And one is where I used to live, across town, and she goes to another school. I didn't know whether to be impressed or <laughs> thinking he was the dumbest kid I'd ever met, all right? I said, my goodness, tell me about it. He says, he says I, I, it's, it's driving me crazy. He says, I've got to call them every day, each one. And then, and then I've got to, I've got to take them out on dates, all right, every weekend. He says that I have to spend money on them. I'm going broke, Jim. And, and I said, wow. I said, that, that's amazing. He said, you got to tell me, what should I do? I need some advice. I put my arm on his shoulder. I said, son, can I call you son? I said, son, you're going to learn this in life one of these days. Less is more right? Less is more, okay? So uh, that was a lesson that he needed to learn. <laughs> but I think we find that true, don't we? In a lot of life, that less is more. I remember in college, one semester, I took 20 units. It was too much. I thought I could bang it out. I couldn't, all right? It was killing me. Uh, it could be in our possessions, you know, yeah, we want that, we want that, we want that. Boy, wouldn't it be great to have a boat or a motorcycle or a cabin up in Tahoe, whatever. You know, and so we get all these possessions, but remember, you got to take care of those things. you got to maintain those things. You have to insure those things. Sometimes less is more. What about food? i got two words for you. Mexican food. God, I'm telling you, it tastes so good. And I eat personally about three bags of chips with my extra mango burrito. But I always pay for it every time. Less is more with food sometimes. With our business issues, less can be more. With the words that we say and all the words that come out continually, the thousands upon thousands of words that we speak and we never stop talking. Sometimes less can be more with our words and then all of our involvements, our activities, our commitments. Sometimes less can be more. And you know what? That can be true in our faith as well. I mean, listen, <clears throat> we have freedom in our relationship with Jesus. That's how God designed our relationship to be, to have Joy and love and peace and fulfillment in life doesn't mean we're not going to struggle. Doesn't mean there won't be tough times, but it's about us and Jesus. And yet sometimes we want to add on more or other people want to add on more or other churches want to add on more. Okay, you've got Jesus, but to really be fulfilled, to really be walking the line for the Lord, to really be holy and set apart, you need to do this, 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 and that. And sometimes those things can wreck our faith. Those things can wreck our faith, church. Now, we've been going through the book of Colossians on Sunday mornings, and we've told you about these false teachers that... Uh, we're, we're, we're threatening to infiltrate this young church 
in the city of Colossae. And some of them had, um, it looks like, Jewish cultural backgrounds. And others had more secular, pagan um, ideas. But they were coming in and they were insisting that these basically new converts in Christ add this, that, and the other. That Jesus alone, trusting him as your Savior, wasn't enough. And so Paul wrote this letter that we're studying, Colossians, to try to correct those errors, to call out the false teachers, and to get the the Colossians back on track so that they might have a strong faith and they might continue in the freedom of their faith in Jesus Christ. And I think there's a message here for each and every one of us, especially those of us that might have... Well, thrown legalistic attitudes at others or have been on the receiving end of that. So I really think God has a word for many of us this morning. Before we go on, I want to read to you our passage. I'm not going to put the words on the screens, but if you've got your Bibles or you've got it on your phone, I'd encourage you to get to Colossians chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verse 16 to chapter 3, verse 1 this morning. It says this. This is the Apostle Paul. Therefore, he says to the Colossians, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism or false humility and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth That is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom, in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. We're going to look at some different faith wreckers that are out there. And I believe by listening to the advice and the admonition and the teaching of God's apostle Paul, that our faith can be strengthened and we can live in the freedom that Jesus intended us to. So before we go on, let's talk with God. Father in heaven, Thank you for your Son, our Savior, Jesus, in whom the fullness of deity dwelt, the God-man, who simply asks us to put our, our trust, our faith in him. Lord, so often... In our faith journey, we're met with those that would want to add on, pile on additional expectations, qualifications. Oftentimes, those can be discouraging. I pray that your word would free us from perhaps some of that pain that we've endured in the past, free us from being that way with one another, and free us to live in the love of your son. 
thank you, Father, for this time together this morning. In your son Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. All right. So this morning, as we look at this passage, I want to suggest three spiritual additives to avoid. And the first is this, Jesus plus legalism. Jesus plus legalism. Now, I'm going to define legalism in this passage, in this context, as a reliance upon rules to maintain favor before God and other believers. Now, as we said, there must have been a Jewish faction in this this non-Jewish church, this Gentile church along the Mediterranean Sea in the modern-day country of, of Turkey. And they had come in, and they were saying, okay, Colossians, you've got Jesus, but you need more than that. If you're going to truly be connected with God, you need to, well, we found out you know, a week ago or so, that well, the men need to be circumcised, for example. And beyond that, You need to know all of the Old Testament laws and rules and regulations and abide by those as as well. They were trying to make these non-Jews Jews, basically. And Paul gets on it. And he says in verse 16, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you. These, These false teachers were judging these young Colossian Christians, in questions of of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. See, we have to realize in the Old Testament days, God had established these dietary laws for the health of the Jewish people, but also to separate them from the pagan nations that were around them. And there were festivals, and God had them uh, observe the Sabbath day to remember uh, his act in creation. You see, all these things were to teach the Jewish people what God had done, to have them recognize the difference between right and wrong. And it was appropriate, and it was good for the faith of the Jewish people at that time. But God did something new in his son Jesus Christ, didn't he? The perfect lamb had come. The perfect lamb of God was sacrificed for the sins, not just of the Jewish people, but now for the whole world. For the whole world. Including the Greeks, including the Romans, including those in in Asia Minor, which is where the church of Colossae was you see you see paul was trying to say it's no longer about those jewish traditions their laws their regulations uh their calendar was based on on new moons and and things like that Uh, those things are gone now that's paul is saying that's not the test of your devotion to god it's not the test of your fellowship to be a part of the church, (laughs) and a follower of Jesus. Listen, legalism can destroy our faith, right? I tried to think of some examples that I've experienced personally. Maybe you have too. And uh, here's one. If you're going to go to church, you better dress a certain way. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, uh (laughs) uh-oh. You better dress a certain way, man. I mean, come on. Men wear suit and ties, slacks, and their hair is short, right? Well, if that was the case here, you guys would have kicked me out months ago, right? You guys let me come up here in my tennis shoes, my vans and my jeans and my shirt untucked. Thank you, Calvary. Thank you, Jesus, all right? That's all I got to say. Thank you. I pastored a church one time. They made me wear a dress shirt and a tie every Sunday. I was forced to. That was in the contract. I used to have a guy in the church after every Sunday morning, 
He wouldn't tell me, hey, you know, this is how I was challenged or this is how I was encouraged through the message of this service. No, it was all about my tie. Whether he liked my tie, whether it clashed with my shirt. I said, I don't know. I don't dress myself. Ask my wife. You know, I had no clue, right? It was all about the dress. And, and as far as the women go, right, it's like, hey, dresses only, no pants, and don't wear too much jewelry, all right? Nothing like that. Uh, for some, uh, legalism is in the form of you can't drink alcohol or play cards, okay? Uh, listen, the Bible doesn't say that you can't have a drink of alcohol. It just says don't get drunk. Why? Because we lose self-control and do stupid things, okay? But it doesn't say you can't have uh, a drink. And it also says, it doesn't say you can't play cards. I think if Jesus would hear, was he, he, he would play go fish, you know, with, <laughs> with your grandkids. He'd have no problem with that, okay? He, he'd, he'd do that. All right, here's one. How about this one? Legalism in the church. No dancing. Oh, no dancing, right? Because we know that dancing can lead to more serious sins, like more dancing, okay? Yeah, we are, we are not going to dance. Wow, I mean, been there, done that. Here's another one. The King James Version is the only true translation of the Bible. If it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me, right? Yeah. Well, let me tell you, not to offend anybody that loves the King James, that's okay. If you want to speak in these and thous and hithereth and whatever, that's fine, okay? But there are a lot of very accurate translations out there that are based on very accurate uh, manuscripts in the original languages, not just the King James Version. Here's one, and this is a little more subtle form of legalism in our churches or in, in, uh, in believers' attitudes, but I call it this, no big sinners allowed. I know, y'all might as well go home now. No, I'm kidding. But no big sinners allowed, right? I mean, hey, it's okay if you're, you know, you're running the middle liar or gossiper. You know, we can handle that, but man... If you've ever been to prison, if you've ever been divorced, if you've ever been a thief, if you've ever done this, hey, man, you know, you, 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 you go find another church, right? If you got tattoos all over your body or you dress like you just came off the streets, uh-uh, right? Something's wrong with you, and we're going to let you know that. That's a form of legalism, right? Here's one. <laughs> I can just go all day on these, right? I mean, here's one. The pipe organ is the only God-ordained instrument to praise God. <laughs> right? No drums, no guitars, no bands, okay? Just the organ, all right? And the church has fought the worship wars for years, and Man, I got to tell you, like, like a lot of, I love all of our worship leaders. One of the things I really enjoy is watching our tattooed drummer, Justin, who's a friend of mine. That guy brings me into worship, man. If you've ever seen him drum, he just goes all out. He's giving it to God. I love the drum cam we have now, you know, and you can watch him. It's awesome. It is awesome. And here's the final one. No movies or music. Yep, no movies or music. My, my wife grew up with that kind of legalism, actually. And her parents had a good heart. They had good intentions. You know, we don't, we don't want, and they were from Greece. They were kind of, you know, right off the boat, right? They, they, they were born in Greece, and they were in the Greek Orthodox Church, and they had converted to Protestant Christianity, and they wanted to live holy lives and raise their family that way. And they came to America you know, with all these opportunities, and yet all this uh, opportunity for temptation as well. So their rules were, for my wife, no movies, no music, right? That's amazing. We just watched The Wizard of Oz. She saw it for the first time last week. I mean, you know, it's crazy, right? 
Sorry, dear, just kidding. But uh, I'm going to pay for that one when I get home. But, uh, but she was raised that way. Yeah, so, you know, those are the type of things. And again, I, uh, I, don't, I don't think that Calvary is a legalistic church. I really don't think we are. I wouldn't have come here if I thought we were. And, um, and I praise God for the freedom that, that you allow each other and that you allow me and our staff to just be who we are. Thank you, church. Thank you. Really. So Paul goes on in, in Colossians 2.17, and he says, you know, all these things, all these rules about food and drink and festivals and, 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 and basing your calendar on, on the position of the moon and, and the Sabbath, he says, you know what? Those were a shadow. Those were a shadow of the things to come. And once he came, the substance belongs to Christ, Paul says. That's what it's about, Jesus, not all this other stuff. Paul says in the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verse 1, for freedom Christ has set us free from all that stuff. So stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Stand in your freedom. Live in your freedom. And beware of people that want to throw their legalistic baggage on you. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. Let's go to the second spiritual additive to avoid, and that is Jesus plus mysticism. Jesus plus mysticism. Now, I'm defining mysticism in our context here as a false humility that seeks visions and the worship of angels and spiritual experiences designed to make a supposed humble person spiritually superior. That's what was going on with another faction of false teachers in the Colossian church. Now, I don't know if you've ever been attracted to kind of the mystical aspects of our faith. I know that I was actually in college. I had not grown up in a church that emphasized or practiced signs and wonders of the Bible, things like dreams and visions and miracles and healings and all that that stuff, and I was intrigued by it. And so I started visiting this church on on Sunday evenings. I had my regular church on Sunday mornings, but on Sunday nights I went to this church because I wanted to learn. And what I found was an overemphasis on the doctrine of healing. Everybody went up to be healed of something, but if you weren't healed, there was something wrong with you. You were a sinner, and that's why God had chosen not to heal you. Um... People had an over uh, interest in, in miracles. Uh, they practice words of knowledge, which is a listed spiritual gift, but the way they practiced it is that um, they would have a ministry time. And I would have these people come up to me who I didn't even know, and they would say, um, God has given me a word of knowledge for you. You, you don't even know me. But God has given me this word that you need to hear through me. And then they tell me something bizarre that didn't have anything to do with my life. And it really kind of shook me. Um, people would have visions and dreams. Uh, they would always be looking for visual manifestations of, of the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that visions don't happen. As you look in Scripture, God spoke to the Apostle Paul through visions at times, through dreams at times. There were manifestations of the Holy Spirit. But what I didn't hear a whole lot of, I didn't hear a lot of talk about obedience or discipleship or serving others. It was all kind of about the individuals, about me and my special connection with God 
and how I can be that conduit to others. Very, very subjective. And, and I got to tell you, in that church at that time, I felt like a second-class Christian. <laughs> I felt like, like I didn't have anything to offer because I wasn't getting these dreams or visions or having these words of knowledge. Um, and, uh, and my faith was discouraged. I felt like I wasn't fully connected to God. Um, and there was something wrong with me. So I had to stop going. In the Colossian church, they had this vibe going on too. By a certain group of false teachers. So Paul says in verse 18, Now let no one disqualify you. Insisting. Underline that word. They were insisting on asceticism. A better understanding of that would be on false humility. And the worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by their sensuous minds. These false teachers were basically coming off on the Colossians, making them feel like they weren't measuring up in humility because they thought they could go directly to God in prayer or through their relationship with Jesus. And they didn't understand how God uh, ministered to us through, through the worship of angels. And they weren't receiving visions. When Paul says, don't let anybody disqualify you, that doesn't mean that they would lose their salvation. That was a, a sports term where a referee would disqualify an athlete. I remember when I was a kid, if it got too rough on the soccer field, the ref would give you a yellow card. And then if it got really rough, I remember tripping a kid one time. I didn't like that kid, all right? I got a red card. I was disqualified. Out of the game, Jimbo, all right? That was gone. I couldn't play the rest of the game. Paul's saying, don't, don't let them be throwing yellow cards and red cards at you. Hey, believer, have you been worshiping angels lately? No, that's a yellow card. What do you mean you don't have a vision for us this week? Red card, disqualified, out of the church. All right? That's kind of what was going on. What does the Bible say about angels? If you're interested, read Hebrews chapter 1. I just want to share a couple of verses with you. See, as far as the Bible is concerned, Jesus is to be worshipped as God. Not angels. Angels are created beings in the, in the proper sense. The writer of Hebrews says in verse 6, and again, when God brings the firstborn into the world, that's Jesus at the incarnation with Mary and Joseph, God said, let, let all God's angels, what? Worship Jesus. See, the angels worship Jesus. And in verse 14, it says, are, are angels not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Well, who is to inherit salvation? Us. Us. The Bible says that one of angels' purposes and ministries is to... Um, to do what God wants them to do in ministering to us. And we know angels such as Michael or Gabriel, the messenger. We don't worship angels. We worship God. These false teachers had it backwards. And they were saying, listen, we're so humble. We wouldn't assume to pray to God directly, to go to God directly. No, as a matter of fact, Jesus isn't God, but he's kind of like an angel, and, and we trust in these angels to be our mediators between us and God. That's what was going on there. And as far as visions, Paul just says, as to your visions the, with those false seeds, that, that's rubbish. That's garbage, okay? That's all the result of their pride. They're not hearing from God. They might think they are, but they're not. And he dismisses it. So Paul says in 
verse 19. See, these, uh, these false teachers, they're not holding fast to the head. And the head is Jesus Christ in the analogy of the body, right? Without the head, the body doesn't function. Like we said, you, don't peop, you, don't see, you, you might see people walking around without an arm or a leg, but you don't see people walking around without a head, all right? Unless it's Halloween, okay? <laughs> Jesus is the head, Paul says, and they're not connected to the head. They're zombies, man. <laughs> From whom the whole body, he's talking about the church, us, are nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. Paul keeps bringing the Colossians back to Jesus. Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus is the source that supplies the church with its energy and its life. Not all this other stuff that they're trying to lay on you, whether it's legalistic or mystic. Now again, hear me, church. I'm not saying that God can't do miracles. I think he does. And I'm not saying that uh, God can't work in ways that, that, that I might not understand. That's okay. I'm not God. He is. If God wants to work through a vision or through a word of knowledge or through a healing, he can. And I, and I celebrate that. But I make sure it's God. I make sure it's not out of my ego or the ego of anyone else. That it's filtered through the head who is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. There's a third additive that you want to avoid, and that's Jesus plus asceticism, Paul says. Asceticism. Now, what's asceticism? It's kind of a word we don't use a lot these days. Well, again, in context, asceticism is the self denial of the body. Things that the body needs, things that might bring pleasure to the body, based on man-made rules to earn favor with God. Now, some of the false teachers, they saw the body as, as non-spiritual, all right? So because the body is non-spiritual, you need to deny it. Why? To keep it from giving into temptation and sin. So this led to teachings that sex and marriage was not okay. So they discouraged marriage. It led to people physically getting whips or and beating their bodies, bruising their bodies, making their bodies bleed to, to beat your body into physical submission so you won't sin. Others took it as far as to say, and we see this later in church history, because the body is so weak, because the body are the instruments of temptation and sin, and there's temptation in the world, then why don't we isolate ourselves from the world? And you get in a, whole, a whole ascetic movement with different orders of, of monks that would leave society to deny the body, the ascetic movement, so that they might become closer to God. It's a really different take on our physical bodies. I think of David. I think of his words in Psalm 139 where David is so grateful to God for the body that God gave him, for the creative process in creating him. And David reminds us that our bodies aren't evil. They're not in and of themselves bad. Yes, we are marred by a sinful nature, but we are also created in the image of God. And David says in Psalm 139, verses 13 to 14, he's talking to God. He says, for you, O God, formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He, he doesn't say, I praise you. 
because my body is miserable and nothing more than an instrument of sin. David doesn't say that. He says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My soul knows it very well, he says. David is praising God for his physical body. Jesus being God for all eternity to save the world from their sins, never leaving his deity, took on our flesh, right? Becoming one of us, at the same time, fully God and fully man. If our bodies are so bad, why did Jesus take on our flesh and die for us? So, Paul makes his argument, watch out for this this asceticism, Jesus plus, all this self-denial, even hatred of the body, whatever it might be. He says in verse 20, so if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to, to regulations? He's saying, listen, at your conversion, you left behind worldly and ungodly spiritual influences. These regulations, in the Greek, the word is dogma. He's saying, don't submit to the dogma, all the extra rules and philosophies that these false teachers are putting upon you, okay? That's taking away your freedom in Jesus. He goes on. He gives examples. <laughs> do not handle. Do not taste. Do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. I mean, he's, he, he's basically saying the false teachers don't want you to do anything. Don't handle. Don't taste. Don't touch. Don't see. Don't hear. Don't speak. Don't do anything. Are you going to be contaminated? He says, listen, anything we use physically, like food or, or clothing, that's going to ultimately perish. God's given it to us to be used. Our souls in Jesus Christ are the only thing eternal. That's what ultimately matters, Paul is saying. Listen. If you invite my wife and I over for dinner and you choose to serve us filet mignon steak (laughs) and and you pour us a glass of wine, we won't judge you. (laughs) Promise. We will enjoy what you have prepared and, and, and drink the wine. Now, we won't get drunk but we will enjoy what you've given us. And, and, and if you invite us over for dinner and you serve pizza and root beer, we will be just as grateful. And we won't judge you for that either, all right? Because it's not about food and drink and all this stuff, right? The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, It's right there, black and white, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Amen, church? That's what it's about. It's not about eating this or drinking that or wearing this or blah, 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 blah. It's about righteousness. It's about peace. It's about joy in the Lord through the Holy Spirit. That's what it's about, folks. Paul goes on. He says, all this stuff, verse 23 in Colossians 2, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity of the body. But you know what Paul says? There's no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. No. Paul says... It's not all these outside rituals and rules and regulations that are going to make you holy. It's got to come from the inside. It's 
It's got to come from that inner desire through the power of the Holy Spirit as we give him control of our thoughts and our words and our attitudes and our actions, right? It's the righteousness that comes through knowing Jesus. So what do we do with all this? What do we, okay, great. You know, we're supposed to avoid these, these, these spiritual additives, legalism and mysticism and asceticism. All right, great. So what's the way? The way is this, to embrace our Savior, Jesus Christ, alone. That's the way. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I've seen too many People who have had their faith wrecked through well-intentioned Jesus plus people in the church. People are saying, okay, you got Jesus, but you got to do this, that, and the other. And whether they know it or not, they're really preaching a works righteousness. And rules and regulations and traditions and those who say, well, unless you speak in a certain tongue or unless you're able to heal miraculously or unless you've received this or that, you're not really part of the club. You're not really completely enlightened into what it means to be living in the Spirit. Nonsense. Paul says this, in Colossians 3, 1, if them you have been raised with Christ, that means if you've put your trust and your hope in God's son, his death on the cross to save you from your sin and the power of his resurrection so that we might have the hope to spend eternity in heaven, if you have been raised with Christ, then seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Not all this stuff down here. Seek the things above. Seek Jesus and his way. I like the way Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 puts it. When it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. There was a lot of boasting going around in the Colossian church with these false teachers. They didn't get it. It's not about our works, it's about His grace and giving us the faith to trust Jesus and only him. I heard a, a great analogy that I'd like to close with this morning, this last, uh, this last week. It, a minister was saying, uh, think of the, the thief on the cross. When Jesus was crucified, he was there and one thief was cursing God and the other was open to God and admitted he deserved what he was getting on the cross. And he told the other thief, fear God. This man has done nothing wrong. And he looked over at Jesus and he said, Lord, please remember me when you come in your kingdom. And you remember what Jesus said? Today you will be with me in paradise. So that thief died, and he's at the gates of heaven. And there was a spiritual being there, and he asked him questions. He said, what do you want? He said, well, I, I want to get in. He said, well, have you been baptized? <laughs> no. no, no. Well, do you have a deep prayer life? He didn't have much to say there. Have you been giving to God's work while on earth? Uh, no, no, I didn't, I didn't give much. Have you studied the scriptures about the Messiah? 
a little? Do you understand the, just, the doctrine of justification by faith alone? He said, I, I guess all I have is faith. Then the man said, why should I let you in? All that thief could say is, because Jesus said I could come. Because Jesus said I could come. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Someday, Lord, we're going to leave these physical bodies that you've given us and those that have been yours will face you on that day of judgment and we'll be asked, why should I let you in to my eternal joy in heaven? And truly, the only answer any of us can really give is because of Jesus. Because of what Jesus did for us. Not all the other stuff. Not all the the other things that we've done. Not that we shouldn't live righteous lives and obey you and produce fruit. All that's important. But at the core, it's about what Jesus did. And I pray that we don't forget that. And that we live in the freedom of our relationship with Jesus alone. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray and give you thanks. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.